and someone said to him, uh, every intelligent person in the country is going to vote for you. And he replied, that's not enough, madam. I need a majority. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, here we go again then. It's how to win an election, your insider's guide to the huge political year ahead. I'm still Matt Chorley and I'm still joined by new Labour mastermind Peter Manson, Polly McKenzie, who's director of policy for Nick Clegg in the coalition, and Tory brain box Daniel Finkelstein. Uh, get in touch uh, with all your questions and queries and complaints. You can email us how to win at the times.co.uk. How to win at the times.co.uk. We all well? Oh well, really well. Yeah. So excited about Christmas. Are you? You sound yeah. weary, Matt, of being Matt Chorley, which worries me. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a grim inevitability of it that that will continue. Uh, right. So, in fact, we talk. We're not going to be weary today. We're going to have fun today because there's a sort of there is going to be a Boxing Day special bonus episode over the Christmas break. But we thought it is the period of uh, cracker jokes, and every you know there's a, there's an art to telling political jokes, and we've heard quite a lot recently, particularly from Keir Starmer. The Prime Minister spent this week arguing about an ancient relic that only a tiny minority of the British public have any interest in. Mr Speaker, that's enough about the Tory party. (laughs) So, Peter, does it matter that Keir Starmer uh, tells terrible jokes? I don't think he does tell terrible jokes. He's very amusing in private. He's always been a bit subdued, on the other hand, in public, and now he's sort of coming out, as it were, so I think that's very good news for everybody. And I think that to cheer people up at PMQs and tell a few jokes and mock the Prime Minister, I mean, I, what is there not to like? Well, they have to be good, though, don't they, don't they? <laughs> Me too. I mean, I, I, I've been <laughs> responsible, so fussy. I must admit, for quite a few poor jokes. A high spot for me was when Theresa May became... Uh, Prime Minister, and that was a high spot. Uh, what and for you personally? There was a PMQ oh, joke. Please, man. <laughs> <laughs> a high spot it's for you. It's like speaking to German. Me, yeah. I've got, I've got a, you know, my stories at the end of the sentence. Um, <laughs> the uh, Theresa May told a joke in her first Prime Minister's questions, which was widely panned, and the Times decided it was going to do a uh, an article about how William Hague had told these excellent uh, jokes, and they rang me up. Uh, so that I could say how excellent William Hague's jokes were by comparison with the joke she'd just told. The unfortunate thing was that I'd also written the joke she'd just told, the bad one, <laughs> as well as the what other ones. It? And Remind I had to admit, I can't. It was about trains, and I cannot now remember it. Um, it a lot of joke telling, first of all, it's, got, it's about the moment that you tell it. It's about how spontaneous it seems. Uh, it's about people's reaction to you. Um, so that William Hay could tell a joke and it would work brilliantly, it would land brilliantly. Someone else would tell the same joke, it would land terribly because people weren't expecting to do it. If, you, if you're if you too obviously prepped for it, what might come out as a quip sounds terrible when it's prepared uh, and uh, that's what happened on this occasion. Have you written any jokes for uh, Rishi Sunak? <laughs> I'm not. Uh, the, the thing about joke telling, this is an interesting thing, and I, there's an ethical thing, I think, here, because I was thinking about this before. You know, my view is that if I ever do provide jokes to politicians, yeah. generally you speaking... You can't steal the authorship. Yeah, generally speaking, it's for them. The yeah. only time I really objected, actually, was when the Sunday Times ran a story in which a number of William Hague's jokes, which actually were ones that I'd helped him with... Uh, were ascribed to someone else completely. My view is that after about 10 years, uh, with the permission of the person involved, you probably can... Uh, <laughs> the you know, can, can yeah, but at the time, you really you really uh, can't. Um, they're about helping somebody to make their speeches better and um, you know uh, uh, make a point, get over with. And I do think they matter. Uh, in Prime Minister's questions, it can matter a lot. Polly, Ed Davey, funny man? Uh, uh, no. I mean, Ed, Ed <laughs> is delightful... Uh, kind, generous, sincere, but he's sort of so sincere. I don't know if you've noticed, he really furrows his brow when he speaks because he's just, he's painfully, painfully sincere. But the, the, I think Danny's onto something because jokes sometimes work sort of primarily because of the context. You know, politics is full of these weird contexts where jokes that are not funny can somehow work for sort of morale. That's certainly true in Prime Minister's Questions, where basically it's as if everyone's taking amphetamines and is sort of like jeery jowly, like we, like, and, it, and so they will do that, the call and response thing sometimes, you know, where it's like, I don't know, police numbers up, nurses up, and you just think, 
I'm so painfully embarrassed, yeah. right? But somehow there it works. It sort of around. sounds like a joke. It's got all the component parts. If I'm with Robin Cook, by the way, just on just on the point that you make, making that's absolutely right, Polly. And I remember when Robin Cook went around a tour of different places and he kept on falling out with people. Uh, and we worked on a joke that for was William India, and, India and Pakistan. Yes, yeah, so we worked on a joke, no, and uh, I had the idea that we could say that he could create an ugly scene in a room by himself that was vetoed <laughs> on the grounds that it was un, you know it was uh, it was mean. Uh, and so we we had the end of the joke had no punchline, uh, and we eventually said, well, look, let's just put uh, let don't book it, Robin cook it. It's not funny, but. That's where the punchline because, goes. Because well, we for, ran out of time. For younger listeners, it was Thomas Cook. It. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't. We ran out of time. William just had to deliver that line. <laughs> we didn't ever come up with a punchline. <laughs> it, it brought the house down for exactly the reasons that Polly said. It was in the place where the punchline was supposed to go. People knew it was a punchline, so they laughed. Now, I would say, not yes. that you're the representative of Ed Davy, but you have worked with him before. In fact, he was your first boss. Um, I quite like his stupid stunts. The things he does, the the cat, and because he does it with the air of this is that's because you worked on regional papers, skin, right? Like thin, thin, you know, rather rather than rather than taking himself too seriously, he's realised he leans into these things and he gets in the papers if he's opening a door or setting off a cannon. You know, they're visual jokes rather than you know verbal ones. I, I think that's right. There's a sort of daytime TV vibe <laughs> uh, about them that works, but. But you wouldn't call them jokes, right? Like, no. It, it, you just sort of uh, cringe. It's time to show Rishi soon at the door while opening <laughs> a, a blue door. It's quite good. Well, yeah, but it's not. Burst the bubble. The um, it was it time to yeah burst the balloon, burst the bubble, the Tory bubble. It's funny because you can't believe they actually. No. They actually I liked did the it. one when he drove through a, some blue hay bales in an orange digger. That was good. <laughs> I must say, Matt is very easily pleased, <laughs> very easily amused. <laughs> um, does it, Matt, do you, does it, we'll come in a minute to the uh, the question, of, you know, when you've been involved in these things. Does it make any difference that, you know, serious times, we're in serious times, serious economic times, serious global times. Do you think voters want a funny, because, you know, Rishi Sunak, you wouldn't think, oh, if we invite the Sunaks and the Starmers around, we're going to have a right laugh at dinner, necessarily. But does that matter? But that's not what the joke is for. Again, if you're talking about PMQs or you're talking about party conference, mm. the joke is to build a sense of camaraderie and loyalty amongst your in-group. And then on those rare occasions that a joke really cuts through, it is because it says something that is in line with your actual kind of electoral strategy. Um, it's also aimed for the public. You want the public to nod along. If it cuts through, but you most You want the man don't. and woman, the informed man and woman in the pub to hear it and nod along and say, my God, he got that right. Mm. You know, but, but, but it's because so it's, it's... not just for your own side. No, no, but that's, <clears> it's those cut-through jokes, right? It's because they are essentially a memorable soundbite and they're more memorable because they're, they're witty. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, like Cameron saying to Blair, you know, he was the future once. It's not rolling in the aisles yeah. funny, but it, it lands important. on the message. It's important also that it's mocking and not insulting. Yeah. And you want to deride your opponent. You don't want to rubbish your opponent because the man and woman in the pub won't like it. And they that's won't nod along. You, you want it. You want it also to demonstrate that the person that's telling it is witty, sharp, intelligent, confident, incisive, yeah. confident. There, there's a, Nick Richard Nixon <coughs> is famously supposed to have said uh, to to Ted Sorensen, who uh, was uh, Nick, you know, uh, Kennedy's advisor, that he was really jealous of Kennedy's inaugural speech, which Sorensen had written. So Sorensen said to him, uh, "You mean the bit? Ask not." you know, what you can do for your country. And he and uh, Nixon says, no, no, not that bit. The bit where he said, I do solemnly swear. Right? <laughs> very funny uh, joke. Anyway, this was ascribed to Nixon, very witty <laughs> Nixon. Odd, because Nixon really wasn't witty. Anyway, it turned out years later that Sorensen had just made that joke up. Uh, Nixon hadn't said anything of the sort, and he regretted it, because it made Nixon look like he was, in fact, very funny. But in fact, Nixon, one of yeah, the characteristics yeah. of Nixon, he really wasn't. Um, so I, I, the, one of the reasons you do it is to demonstrate the person is, you know, got a really sharp sense of humour. But it can go wrong if they haven't and it looks terrible or if the jokes are, are terrible themselves. I remember going to a party conference. You'll all have had this experience of people providing jokes from outside. And I don't know whether you've had this, Polly, but I once was given a long list of jokes by Ken Dodd. 
to uh, for William Hague's speech. They were all absolutely... Ter- the ones that weren't terrible, because they were, you know, obviously he's very funny, were just unusable politically, because they were, you know, they, they made jokes that politician couldn't actually use. They all just use. diddy me not and all that <laughs> business. Were. And I, I t- Sebco agreed that he would go back to Ken Dodd and tell him that we couldn't use any of them. I didn't actually have to do that. God, it's amazing, because when you... Because the other week we had Mike back from the Wombles, and it's extraordinary when you think, this is the, our, you know, going into the turn of the, the millennium. Tories. So they, the tour is had um the Tories have had you know Shirley Bassey Jimmy Tarbuck at the time certainly I believe you know um kind of Mike Reed Mike well that sort yeah. of uh comedian and, le- and let's bomb Russia uh, Kenny oh, yeah, Everett. Kenny Everett. whereas yeah. the Labour Party had sort of Billy Bragg Paul Weller it was like much yeah. cooler but with smaller audiences basically <laughs> um <laughs> Smaller, I think, is generous. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about what. What about the Liberal Democrats? Did the Liberal Democrats have, or the, or the, I suppose the Women's Equality Party did. Well, mm. yeah, that had Sandy Toxvig. But actually, the reason I had Sandy Toxvig's email address was because she had, on one occasion, provided Nick Clegg with a joke of of some sort, along with some of the sort of behind the scenes news quiz type people. And and you would also get lots of very peculiar people writing in with really quite lengthy jokes and 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 you know most of them are terrible but as i say most of the time especially for a party conference speech it doesn't really matter because you've just you've got to have something to add add the light to the shade of the conference speech or it's boring uh, much better if you can come up with a funny joke but you know sometimes sometimes it's can't. also good for morale as well and that's important so in a minute i want to ask about when you've written jokes which have worked well uh jokes that have landed politically because they seem to be the ones that we're uh, we're, we're talking about and, and what's it like when somebody else gives you a joke to deliver and you have to try and uh, make it work we will do that next on how to win an election we're talking political jokes this week because politicians across the country will be sitting down and putting their crackers and hoping to find some good material uh, for the new year Danny let's start with you because before we launched how to win an election uh, we did film some little videos and, and asked what your party tricks all were um, and you said your party trick was you were sort of dial a joke Yes. That people would call you up and just say, I'm, I'm speaking at the Scottish Whittlers Society and I need to add a message sat, about trains. Give us some jokes. I've honestly, I've sat in a, in, a, in a motorway service station and the phone went off and it was the current Prime Minister at the time. And my wife was sort of quite impressed that the current Prime Minister had rung and I answered the phone. And it was, she just wanted a joke uh, for uh, the speech that he had to give in half an hour. And uh, my wife was less impressed by that. Uh, so it's, it's like it's a facility I'm somewhat embarrassed by, the ability to come up with a pun or a line for a speech if, I, uh, if they haven't um, got one. Um, just, uh, you know, the problem with these things, they're always... Um, quite lame when you repeat them without context but um, as an example when Ken Livingston uh, and Frank Dobson were both um, running for the mayor of uh, London and, and Tony Blair was juggling between them I came up with the idea that he should have two mayors which is he could have um, he could have Frank Dobson during the day and Ken Livingston could be his nightmare Right. And that worked that's very well. hilarious. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now the thing, the thing that's interesting about it is, objectively delivered like that, it isn't hilarious. Obviously, <laughs> thank you, Peter. But, <laughs> but at the time in the House of Commons, it, it really, really worked, and I knew it would as well. So it's all about a lot of this is about context, and so almost all these political jokes are like really lame when you're, you know, they're not, uh, they're not. Anyway, I'm not, not one to laugh. I've never written a joke in my life. It's a major deficiency. What about the eighty-seven manifesto. That was hey. thank you very much. <laughs> well, better than the longest suicide note, That's which true. was 83. That's Jokes can be so valuable at uh, showing resilience when something bad has happened, right? Because the idea that you can make light of it yeah. uh, makes you look much stronger. And therefore, actually, it means that you're much safer from, from whatever mm. it is. One of the jokes that really sticks in my mind was when uh, Cherie Blair had been overheard sort of bad mouthing Gordon Brown around the Labour conference hall yeah. uh, and Blair's speech the next day he started off by saying well at least I um, don't have to worry that she'll run off with the guy next door Yeah, and, the it was... down, and it's immediately sort of calmed and diffused exactly. the tension between it's... him and Gordon exactly uh, and the point is it hasn't got to me 
So you don't need to talk about it anymore. And it actually yeah. takes all of, uh, well, not all of the sting, but a lot of the sting out of a controversy and means you can move on. Buys space for your actual sort of political message. Actually, Keir message. was quite good at drinks he gave for the lobby hacks last week. And he said in 2017, the Daily Mail were describing him as weak and floundering. And now he's pleased to report that they're now just describing him as floundering. <laughs> <laughs> that's Do real that, progress from the Daily Mail. By the way, he also t- he also told a joke saying that he's got really big, ambitious plans uh, for 2024, and he's looking forward to reading about them in Patrick Maguire's column in the Times, uh, <laughs> along with everyone else, which is also very nice. Yeah, I mean, I, but the, the good, that joke earlier, everyone laughed. That is the test. By the way, yeah. if you're preparing a joke for a speech, do people laugh? Not do they sit there and go, objectively, I think that's funny. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's actually, do they do they is laugh there, at that is time? Do they laugh spontaneously? Adlai Stevenson had those couple of great one, uh, ones when uh, the the American Democrat who lost president one was after he lost, saying uh, he started his speech with a funny thing happened to me on the way to the White House, which was a pretty good uh, joke. But the other time was when someone said to him, uh, uh, "Every intelligent person in the country is going to vote for you," and he replied, "That's not enough, madam. I need a majority." <laughs> I thought was that Michael show. Heseltine was also very good at these jokes. You know, his standard conference repartee and stage conference speech. You know, would would contain all sorts of barbs. I always remember in the lead up to the nineteen ninety seven election when Gordon Brown was sort of setting himself out as this great sort of erudite sort of super economist and statesman, and uh, Ed Balls, who was advising him at the time, uh, had written out a long sort of essay uh, about endogenous economic uh, growth, which Michael promptly attributed. Uh, to Gordon and said, "Well, it's not brown; it's balls," uh, and that brought the house down. So, what's? But I suppose I think what we were sort of groping towards is the fact that they work when there's an element of political truth and attack in it. it yes. That actually just a sort of funny pun uh, is is not enough. That actually it needs. To, so, what some of the ones that I was thinking of was it's not brown; it's balls. Um, Vince Cable uh, did all of his best thinking in the bath. I understand. <laughs> And which you can read about in, in a book, Planes, Trains and Toilet Doors. It's one of the my 50 places. Which That's a really politics. great book, really actually. Good. I bought a lot for Christmas with you. Um, uh, so, and he was in the bath and he came up with a line about, we've all seen Gordon Brown's transformation from Stalin to Mr. Bean. Now, yeah. part of the way, it's not that funny. I still don't actually get it. Well, well he used I, to be a clunking fist and now he's like a, uh, in at Wally. That's the... Well, it's mean, as, yeah, it's but... as he went downhill from 2007 yeah. to 2008. So he 2008. sort of took over The summer was great and then everything went wrong. And he, so he'd gone from sort of iron fist to... Uh, but just, apparently a move, a move from being a crumpled. complete mass murderer to being... Uh, silent comedy mime was up d- downhill. <laughs> it's a degrade, apparently. But uh, it's not a very good. On paper, it's not a very good joke because it doesn't. It's not like it, it doesn't rhyme. It's not like from Mister Stalin to Mister B. You know, there's no. But I think it rings true because it's the sort of thing that Vince Cable would say. He did come up with it himself. It's not like yep. his fall from uh, Bruno Brooks to you know using things that he wouldn't know about. And and it was so unexpected so Vince Cable was the interim leader um and so he was just doing a little stand-in gig as the person who got to ask a couple of questions is when the Lib Dems got two questions um and nobody was anticipating that he was being any good he wasn't even standing to be the leader and so the idea that he might, in fact, have some sort of superstar quality just really sort of blew everyone's mind. And what's weird is he then went on to ask a really boring, forgotten question, something to do with the armed forces, which had nothing to do with that line. He just clearly thought it was a, it was a, it was a good line. He got out of the bath too soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, the other one that I, I just because I, it, 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 I think it might be the best sort of comedy routine, because I didn't see William Hague in the flesh during the Smashbox. The first PMQs after it was revealed that Ed Miliband had got two kitchens. David Cameron just went to... T- they'd obviously had... Maybe, Daddy, you wrote some of them. The, oh, obviously, yeah. everyone had got a two kitchens joke. And he did all of them. I think I did provide him one. I can't remember now um, what it was. And by far my favourite was he was like... Everyone was like falling out laughing. He said, no, 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 come on, come on, come on, calm down. I feel I feel sorry for uh, the right honourable gentleman. You know, at the end of the day, he just doesn't know where his next meal's coming from. <laughs> which is such a brilliant joke it's such a brilliant joke I mean ultimately it doesn't make any difference to 
but it might have been one of those weeks where the government was in trouble and there's no way that Ed Miliband can can mess Look, this up. And actually, just telling a load of jokes is good deflection. It certainly was important to William Hague to be able to, when he when he was leader, to be able to keep the backbenchers on side at a time when the party and keep the morale of the party up when people were behind you and uh, when, when he was when he was the people are behind you in the Commons and they're not very uh, impressed by your leadership <laughs> in, in other ways and it just keeps the morale up and it is a time when you can take it to the other side so it did matter and he did William Hague Rory Bremner had this he said that on Wednesday mornings I get together with my team uh, and we think where the country's going and William Hague's team gets together and sees whether he can devise a joke and, there was something, <laughs> and that was something true to it which, it was, is, which was this is a very important uh, um, case from history because William Hague came every week and pummeled Blair at PMQs with his jokes. And Blair just couldn't get on top of the thing at all. And there was a big brainstorming session in number 10, um, well recorded. Uh, David Miliband said to Tony Lip, for goodness sake, don't, don't go into PMQs like you're sort of sitting an exam and you cram every fact into it. You just wanted to sort of have us some one-liners and some put-downs and Alistair Campbell provided a whole shed load, none of which Tony really liked. They weren't quite uh, him. What Tony used to do with each of these Tory leaders was find an argument against them with, it, with which he could just sort of sum up their whole performance. With John Major, it was uh, weakness. Mm. I lead my party you follow yours if you remember mm. and that seemed to sort of capture the whole essence of what major was going through with william haig what he got to after a lot of thought and observation was uh, that the right honorable gentleman is better at jokes than judgment so he turned his jokes turned, against yeah, him exactly. and every time william haig came up with something dumb he just would say the same he's better at jokes uh, than uh, uh, judgment William, uh, no, Michael Howard was opportunism. That's the sort of lens that Tony created to uh, uh, to uh, to attack him. There was one other Tory leader I can't remember. Oh yes, IDS. You didn't really, <laughs> sorry, you didn't, didn't you really, you didn't really need any attack lines on IDS because they were supplied by his own side. The one, jo no, the one joke I thought actually has had unintentionally long-running consequences is the joke that Liam Byrne left. When he that left was the treasury, not funny. There's uh, sorry, there's no money. Yeah, very funny, very very droll. He left it as a joke, and it's still a problem now. Yeah, and you've got that just to demonstrate, by the way, you've got to be extremely careful of things that you leave in quotation marks. I mean, anyone who's been on Twitter and has tried to make some joke which they don't explain the context of knows that everyone then takes it incredibly yeah, seriously up, and exactly. that. So it's very important, not, you know, not to do that. The other thing that you don't want to do, and William Hague was was you know, very sort of firm about this is tell disastrous jokes that people don't laugh at. If, you, if you've if got any question, I mean, anyone who's been to the Conservative Party conference, I remember once John Redwood making a joke about Ian McCartney, and the joke was, <laughs> step forward, Ian McCartney, and walk tall among the men. Right, so, a number of things. First of all, almost nobody in the hall <laughs> knew who Ian McCartney was. Nor thing, did they know how short he was. Secondly, if they did know that, they didn't know he was short. If they knew he was short, that is actually not very not funny. Not a very nice thing it's to say. It's not a very nice thing yeah. to say. So I do remember, and then he, he told this joke, and then he paused for people to laugh, which oh. they obviously didn't. The hall was only half empty. Also important, by the way, that there has to be enough people there to, <laughs> to laugh at it, otherwise it's awful. And he waited for them to laugh, and didn't. And there was a sort of moving, a, a scraping chair in the back. <laughs> it was it was really excruciating, actually. Um, so, uh, and then another, I saw another cabinet minister once say that the uh, Labour Party had no principles, and they had a shopping bag from principles, the shop, <laughs> and they sort of looked, and they went, they took the bag out and looked inside the bag and said, there's oh, nothing, there's nothing here, here, and threw it over his shoulder. That was a disaster as well. So sometimes you can really, you've got to really make sure that you, you make the joke stick. And if you do, then it, it, it may not change the political landscape, but it, you know, the other thing that we're sort of undervaluing is people making speeches for, if you make a speech for half an hour, I don't know, but I'm sure Peter does this too, um, you, you try and make sure that it's amusing and interesting in some way. I mean, you must, you're <laughs> saying you're not funny, but I mean, first of all, you use, you, Peter, you use humour the whole time. As I use humour against myself most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, and Ed Miliband. The conference hall thing is really interesting because it is only really during a leader's speech 
or possibly a Boris Johnson speech when he wasn't the leader, that you get that packed hall and that you have the warm up video and you have the cheering and at Lib Dem conference, you have the buckets passed around to raise money. And, and, and there's a sense of the height that you might get at it, you know, at, at some sort of like stand up gig or something. Not that much but still you and there's the mood in the room that means people will, people will laugh. laugh which if and, you're the third on in a debate on pencils it's well, exactly so that's the thing is if you are a sort of third tier uh, shadow cabinet member or cabinet member even and you've what you've watched is the video clip of somebody saying something a bit lame and the whole falls about the laughter you're trying to replicate yeah. that what you don't realize is actually what you've got is the sort of vibe of a bingo night on a tuesday i did actually want to write some jokes for nick clay um, uh, late at night in a bar. It, Did you give uh, them to him? Uh, I gave them to somebody who worked for him, and they were all judged to be completely unusable, but quite funny. Well, I, <clears> I was the person. So I was Nick's speechwriter. Yeah, for I don't. Th- I'm not sure they've got to you. I think. Some, and, I think. <laughs> I think. Um, and I was the person desperately looking for jokes, and I tended to put. In, I should have come straight to you. I put in placeholder jokes until somebody came up with something better, and then half the time they were the ones that made them in and yeah we ended up making a joke about how david cameron was a bit like toilet duck which is <laughs> not my that, finest hour you did that joke where you said you wouldn't put up tuition fees and then you waited ages for the punch <laughs> whoa, whoa 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 <laughs> right so let's it's move supposed on. to be christmas oh, come on it's christmas right, right, it's not right, quite christmas it's not Jewish, christmas. Christmas. You forget that. right we'll do some of the uh emailed in questions listeners have been in touch we've absolutely bulging inbox in fact next week we're going to do a whole load of your questions because uh we've got so many of them uh but bev has been in touch saying dear matt peter polly and daniel a brilliant and entertaining podcast who knew politics was so funny you did. <laughs> My question is, what role do the wives, husbands, partners of political party leaders play in an election? And when has it gone wonderfully right or horribly wrong? Thanks again and Merry Christmas, Bev. So I suppose the most obvious example of this most recently was Rishi Sunak getting his wife at Charter up at a uh, party conference. Which it f- did it feel a bit retro there? It's a bit odd. Always feels a bit, a, cringe. a bit awkward because, you know, the fact that the person who's married to you thinks that you're quite nice is a, a bit of a low bar. I, I, I think that um, even though it's so often women doing this, and I feel a bit uncomfortable with that, I actually think having a spouse in that supporting role where they go out and do visits with their partner can be quite nice, especially when you're doing visits with, like, f- photos, whether it's walking on a beach or, like, meeting kids in a primary school or something. The idea of just looking a bit more human by being there as part of a married couple can, can work nicely. But... You shouldn't make the spouse responsible for like giving a speech and having political opinions because in the end they're not the ones standing for election. So l- weirdly, l- uh, there's, there's been a study, social psychologists study this. If you phone, say, an estate agent and you're got put through the receptionist, the receptionist says, "I'll push you through to X. He's a real expert in exactly these properties that you're looking for or you want to sell." Uh, that works. You would think it obviously wouldn't work, but in fact it does work. Third party. So, in other words, I think having the wife or spouse or you know the spouse of a leader endorsing them, it shouldn't work, but it does, and it's the reason why they have it in the United but the States. State agent was... secretary isn't their wife, are Might they? Be. Might be, suppose. Well, I'm not. I'm, I'm just them. saying. In other words, I'm just saying that <laughs> even though you know yeah. that the endorsement's not coming from an independent source, yeah. the endorsement still works. The the, the my favourite example of a spouse in an election was um, Ask, uh, Atlee's wife, Violet, who drove him round all the polling stations in, in the election and all of his speeches, and then on the day went out and voted Conservative. Yeah. As she <laughs> but that thought. was not her biggest role, uh, Danny. Her biggest role was that on the day that the election result was announced in 1945, at the Beaver Hall in Westminster was a gathering of the Parliamentary Labour Party and Labour Party bigwigs, including my grandfather, who were all plotting how to replace Attlee as the leader and the one who would go to the palace to kiss hands, at which point Vi Attlee grabbed Clem, put him in the driver's seat of her car, raced up the mouth, straight into Buckingham uh, (laughs) Palace, deposited Clem at the front door, who was duly made king, uh, by the king, uh, duly made prime minister by the king, whilst all the plotters were back in the Beaver Hall <laughs> trying to decide which amongst so them would take his place. She wasn't that much of a Tory in the end. Oh, she was. A, she was. A, she, she was a Tory. Was, yeah. She really was a Tory, yeah. but she wasn't having she wasn't her Clem there. pushed to one side. She was going to be there with him in number ten, and no nonsense. She was very determined. Is is because it feels to me like even the time I've been covering politics, the the the, the sensitivities about this that the the sort of the the wife going up on stage and kissing 
at the end of a party conference speech, that's done less and less now. Do you think culture has changed a bit, Polly? I, I think a little bit. And, you know, there have been uh, political wives who have tried to be a... I mean, you know, Samantha Cameron tried to do a bit more of the sort of first lady-ish stuff. She had a, a tiny office of her own and she tried to have something of, of an agenda of things she cared about. But it just... It always feels weird to me because, in the end, they're not the one that you elected. Yeah, I mean, no, but, but they're not trying to take the place of the prime minister. They're not trying to be the prime minister. You're right. The start, going on a visit is one thing. Giving a political speech at party conferences is a different thing. Because Sarah Brown did it for it's Gordon Brown when he was It's not a political speech. It's a speech about uh, their husband. And I think both... Uh, Wish's wife. I know it was a bit cringy, but I think it worked. It was quite effective. In and no, I think Sarah. No other walk of life. If you were nice. having a bad time at work, would you think the solution is to get your wife in and make a speech about <laughs> how how deep down he's actually a really good chap? Have you asked your wife? Yeah. I mean, the idea that I'd get her to make a speech about me. I mean, I would. Yes. That's not yeah, being broadcast. It sounds rather <laughs> ridiculous, especially <laughs> pleading. But most of, most modern wives of prime ministers do an enormous amount of work in Number Ten. They raised a lot of money for charity. They do a lot of receptions. They reach out to a lot of people. Um, there's a lot of sort of unspoken, very, very good social political work with a small p undertaken by prime ministers' wives. Uh, and I think that's how it should be. Yeah, look, there's an awful lot of work goes into trying to make people connect, uh, who, are, who are prime ministers, connect with as people. Yeah. Uh, and it's just a way that they uh, can do that. Uh, it's not in my view, you know, the difference between victory and defeat, but it's helpful. Uh, and if the, if your partner's willing uh, to do that, uh, then then I think it, you know, I think there's something to be to be said for it. And actually, the single best thing that a partner of a politician can do is just stop you going mad, because the job is, you know, having a strong person at home to listen to you in your mad life is probably more useful than any. I think that's true. Life. You need, I mean, uh, what a politician needs. Most of all, is somebody who will tell them when they are, are losing their mind. You know, like <laughs> somebody who can just close the door and yeah. say, "What the hell are you doing?" Yeah. And that might be one of their closest advisors, who can spot when they've just, you know, sort of lost perspective. Um, but actually, if if a wife or husband can do that, that's an incredibly valuable contribution. Yeah, inevitably, they are important advisors. If you look at if you look at Philip May, for example, or. I think Samantha Cameron was a big influence on David. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I, I don't know. You'll be more capable of saying what the influence of Cherie Blair, whom I've always regarded as a very impressive person, on um, uh, Tony Blair was, and S Sarah Brown. I think these. these Tony you know, so told me once he could not have got through it. I mean, all the pain of Iraq, all the pain of Gordon and his supporter, supporters trying to bring him down. Uh, at a very crucial time, it was some years in advance before he went, it, it was a very, very bad time, and he told me I could not have done it without Shuri at my side. She was not only very political, she was very strong. But I remember also, after a terrible election campaigning day in Rochdale, Gordon, when he'd left his mic on, and he'd had this terrible exchange oh, yeah. with Gillian Duffy, and got into the car and said, you know, what a bigot she was. And it was just, then he would, found himself in a BBC studio to give an interview without realising that they had the recording. Anyway, at the end of this absolutely horrible day, Sarah was coming from Scotland to meet him. Uh, I think he was in Manchester. And Gordon said, shall I go and get Sarah off the train? I said, go and get her off the train. Go up, put her, throw your arms around each other. Uh, and they came back. And somehow it just lowered the temperature, it diffused it, just by Sarah being there and giving him a big hug. And she looked great, both of them, and went on. Uh, and it was sort of put behind them pretty much the next day. It left a terrible sort of memory, obviously. Yeah. We're still talking about it. But that was a very, very interesting <laughs> intervention by a wife who didn't say anything, who didn't make a speech, who just smiled and put her arm around her husband. What what a great lot of stories! Thank you for that, Bev. Uh, Bev emailing in uh, to how to win an election. You can get in touch with us. You email us how to win election at the times dot uk. And next week on Boxing Day, a very special Christmas episode where we ask, uh, well, we'll try to answer as many of your questions as possible. But for now, for me, Matt Jolly, from Peter Manson, Daniel Finkelstein, and Polly McKenzie, that was how to win an election. Mm -hmm.